six, five, four, three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Switch off your mobile phones. It's time to begin. Young people are digital natives. They are closer to digital elements, so they can facilitate the digital transformation of our countries and participate um, in this digital transformation in making it faster for our countries, regions, as well as our society. What we would like to try to achieve today is to have the direct dialogue between the executives who actually take the decisions for their countries, for their regions, for their companies, councils, and the young activists who try to make things, um, useful things for uh, the development of our countries and during this COVID crisis. My name is Yulia Morenets, and I'm very pleased and honored to be joined today by, by our distinguished guests. We have with us the uh, Minister uh, Dr. Sidi Ul Salem, who is the Minister of ICTs and also the Port Parole of the Government of Mauritania. Uh, Dr. Sidi Ul Salem, please be welcome. I will be switching now in French. So to welcome uh, Minister, but also you will have, for those of you who don't speak French, you will have the translation in the chat room and after made by our uh, great uh, translator from the uh, IGF United Nations. Uh, Monsieur le Ministre, soyez le bienvenu. Merci uh, d'être aujourd'hui avec nous et merci tout d'abord uh, d'avoir accepté cette invitation. De, de venir discuter avec la jeunesse, mais d'apporter aussi le point de vue et la vision de qu'est-ce qui se passe dans ce pays qui est la Mauritanie en termes d'innovation technologique et de soutien aussi que le gouvernement et euh, les politiques publiques apportent à la jeunesse, à la jeunesse qui, euh, qui euh, fonctionne et qui fabrique, je dirais, euh, la, 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 les nouvelles, les innovations. Voilà, Monsieur le ministre, soyez le bienvenu et merci encore d'être euh, là avec nous. On reviendra vers vous dans quelques instants en français. We Merci. have with us as well, uh, I'm switching into English for, and uh, we have with us Bokar Ba. Bokar Ba is the CEO and the board member of Samena Telecommunications Council. Bokar Ba, please be welcome. Samena Telecommunications Council is the uh, council, as the terms uh, says this, of different telecom uh, companies um, based in the Middle East, if I'm not mistaken, Bokar Ba. So we will be discussing on the role of the telecom sector, which which is quite important in empowering young people, you know, uh, for their in the innovation and also in uh, in their activism to uh, to help during this crisis COVID situation. We do know that the ITU, the specialized ITU agency of the United Nations, has as one of the strong strategic priorities the empowerment of young people. So it will be interesting to discuss uh, with the. Uh, Bokarba in a while, and thank you for joining us. We have with us Kasper Klingi. Kasper Klingi, the Vice President of Microsoft Corporation. It's always great to have Kasper Klingi with us and uh, with all the support he is giving and bringing to the young people. So thank you so much, Kasper Klingi. You are also the former diplomat and actually the former uh, first ever diplomat and ambassador to the Silicon Valley, uh, which is quite amazing. Thank you, Kasper Klingi, for joining us. 
We have as well with us Professor Rolf Weber from the Zurich University working on international law. Uh, thank you, Professor, for joining us. And you work a lot on the legal and policy aspects of artificial intelligence and blockchain. And obviously, when we say blockchain and um, artificial intelligence, we immediately think about young people and innovators. So we'll be very, we will have a lot to learn from you um, as well on these on these aspects. And thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, we have with us the uh, representatives of the youth IGFs and different youth communities present in our studio as well. So I would like to, uh, to welcome them and also to remind that please you can put your questions and your comments in the chat room. We have also the live stream on the uh, United Nations um, uh, channel, uh, YouTube channel. So you can put your questions and comments there as well, as well as on our Facebook page of the Global Youth IGF. So please be welcome. But before we start this conversation be be between the executives, and the young leaders, I would like to bring a very strong um, message, video message to you that was sent to us by the UN Under Secretary General Fabrizio Hochschild, who is not here with us today physically because it's a night time in New York. But I would like to propose you to follow me for this message, and then we will back uh, for um, uh, for our discussion. Let's go. Warm wishes to you from New York. It's great to be able to contribute uh, to this session. You have so much more interesting things to say than I, so I really will be uh, very brief. I thought the framing of the subject was really quite curious. Uh, I was told the subject is youth activism in the digital sector. I thought that was a little ironic because, of course, the digital sector would simply not exist if there was no youth or youth activism. Let's just imagine for a minute that over the past 30 years, all under 30 year olds had been kept hidden away in a dungeon. I think if that had been the case, I'm not sure we would have a digital sector today. Youth activism basically constitutes the vast part of uh, our digital world. But now, and this is my main point, I would argue that we have created, or you've created, this beautiful thing, but we have a challenge no longer technical, but much more social and political in terms of maximizing its benefits and curtailing its malicious use and its unintended harms. We have to work harder now to make sure that this great invention, your invention, is inclusive, safe and secure. COVID has shown just how dependent we've grown on digital technologies. By now, most of us cannot work without them, can't socialize without them, can't have leisure without them. And of course, they've helped immensely in the response to COVID, from tracking to sharing cures, etc. But we have to acknowledge that those who are not connected have been left further behind, have been left more vulnerable. And those who are connected have also grown more exposed to digital harms, such as disinformation, uh, data robbing, security breaches, etc. So how we now steer this tool that grew largely through initiative, through entrepreneurship, with very little global steerage, how we steer it will determine what our digital legacy will be, whether it will just be a magnificent thing that benefits some, or whether it will reduce the bane of our age, growing exclusion and inequality, whether the majority will be left safer or more vulnerable. And so that I would put before you is the challenge for your generation and I really look forward to the initiative and the leadership, I have no doubt, 
youth across the world will exercise in that. And I look very much forward to learning from you. Thank you. So um, I think it was a quite powerful message uh, brought to you by the uh, UN Under Secretary General saying that, well, um, you know, it's not only technical. Today we need to try to, to see how this benefits um, the benefits of the technical innovation can um, can get value. And um, by saying this, I would like to turn to our young activists. And first of all, um, to turn to Aileen uh, from Kenya. Aileen, are you with us? Aileen? Yeah, I'm with you. Thank you. Do you have the camera? Can we see you? I think you have a question, so we will be happy to bring this to our panelists. Uh, I'm having a problem starting my video. I don't know why. All right. So, uh, do you have a question to our panelists so they can we can start the uh, real dialogue and the conversation? Yeah, sure. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can even see you, which is quite great. So, Ellen, please, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, my question is, we as the youth, we are the future generation, yeah? And uh, we really have great minds of innovation. So what is the government doing, respective governments doing to ensure that they support the youth in uh, the innovations that they have uh, with regards to the COVID-19? Thank you. Thank you, Aileen. Um, thank you for asking your question. And I um, maybe let's turn to Minister Sidi Ul Salem. Uh, I don't know if you got the uh, the translation in um, the translation in French. Uh, Monsieur le Ministre, en effet, je pense que uh, Hélène de, qui vient de Kenya, elle, uh, elle posait la question d'une manière suivante. Comment est-ce que, qu'est-ce que les gouvernements font aujourd'hui uh, dans le domaine du numérique afin d'aider uh, les personnes, uh, les, les jeunes personnes qui veulent prendre uh, uh, le leadership pour faire quelque chose d'utile pour la société afin de les aider. Voilà. Et uh, par là même, peut-être que vous pourriez donner le point de vue de Mauritanie. Qu'est-ce qui se passe en Mauritanie? Quelles sont les mesures qui ont été mises en place uh, par le gouvernement mauritanien et notamment par votre ministère? Monsieur le ministre. Bien, merci. Euh, je vous remercie et je suis très honoré d'être parmi vous dans ce débat. La première chose, c'est que le numérique, l'écosystème qui entoure la quatrième révolution industrielle qui arrive, interpelle tous les gouvernements, interpelle toutes les sociétés à, à bâtir tout un écosystème. Donc, beaucoup de gens pensent seulement au Covid. Oui, le Covid a fait, a fait naître qu'on gagnerait énormément de choses avec le numérique en tant que levier de développement et en tant qu'outil pour le développement durable, pour une économie de la connaissance, pour une économie Alors, ça, c'est en gros. Mais c'est vrai que le, le vrai défi euh, de cette transformation, euh, c'est le classique. Donc, euh, première étape, c'est la connectivité. Beaucoup de nos pays ne sont pas très bien connectés. Il faut avoir euh, la, la large bande, donc euh, gros débit, euh, avoir la sécurité numérique, donc avoir plusieurs connectivités internationales. C'est le cas de la Mauritanie, on est connecté jusqu'à présent à un seul câble, le câble ACE, et ça c'est un problème, parce que on est dans une zone quand même de forte activité halieutique, donc beaucoup de bateaux, et on a eu deux accidents sur ce câble. Donc et ça, ça nous interrompt complètement dans notre connectivité internationale. Le deuxième problème qui se pose dans tous les pays en développement, c'est la distribution de cette capacité de haut débit. Une fois que vous avez la connectivité, il faut aussi la distribuer dans nos pays, par un backbone, par un système de réseau en fibre optique ou un autre système. Et, et donc ça, ça pose aussi un problème pour la Mauritanie qui, qui fait quand même deux fois le territoire de la France, cinq fois le Sénégal. Donc c'est des vrais défis de développement en termes de France. Troisième étape après cette distribution et après cette connectivité, c'est l'accessibilité du plus grand nombre de citoyens, du plus nombre de jeunes à cet à cette Internet. Donc l'accessibilité à des laptops, à des iPads, à des smartphones, et la portabilité des coûts de connectivité et des coûts de consommation. Donc, ça, c'est les choses, les fondamentaux de l'État. Après, bien sûr, vont se poser le problème de, des compétences, des formations, de l'alphabétisation numérique, de la culture du numérique, 
et de la culture de cette transformation de passer de, de la connaissance à travers des livres, vers de la connaissance sur des livres numériques, sur des bibliothèques numériques, sur du e learning sur de... Donc, voilà, c'est tout un écosystème qui est en train d'être bâti. Bon, ça, c'est de manière générale, c'est la conception globale. Le cas particulier de la Mauritanie, je pense qu'on a fait de grands pas, euh, des très grandes avancées dans ce domaine. D'abord, la prise de conscience de l'État que le développement des technologies de l'information et de la communication est un vrai levier de développement. Ça permettra à nos pays de faire des raccourcis sur la trajectoire de développement. Nous ne sommes pas obligés, et Dieu merci tout le monde le comprend, nous ne sommes pas obligés de bâtir une énergie de l'automobile, une, enfin une industrie de l'automobile, une industrie de, de l'avionique ou une industrie de ceci, cela. On n'est pas obligé de prendre le, la même trajectoire qu'un pays développement. Avec l'économie de la connaissance, si ça se développe bien, on peut développer des prototypes, on peut développer des innovations. Euh, euh, sur, par des simulateurs, par des centres de calcul, par des, des compétences avérées. Et une fois, on va passer au prototypage, là, on aura besoin d'avoir des installations. Donc, cette, cette connaissance et cette prise de conscience de l'intérêt digital dans l'avenir nous a amenés tous à lancer des processus, des stratégies de digitalisation et de transformation digitale de nos pays. Bien sûr, il y a le cadre juridique de la Société mauritanienne des Français qui a été mis en place. Donc, c'est un arsenal de, de textes juridiques qui organisent un peu le fonctionnement des nouvelles technologies et les règles juridiques, la protection, la sécurité, la cybersécurité, mais aussi travailler sur la connectivité, sur la distribution de la, des capacités, sur, là, on va, on va cette année avant la fin de l'année passer à la 4G, euh, mais c'est l'accessibilité et l'abordabilité qui seront les grands défis. Euh, nous travaillons sur l'intranet du gouvernement, la, la distribution des processus individuels. Donc, voilà, c'est un ensemble de visions qui amène de toute la situation. Mais c'est vrai que la jeunesse est plus apte à comprendre ces enjeux, ces transformations, et ils sont plus, plus alertes à contribuer et à diffuser même cette culture d'utilisation des smartphones. Euh, dans des pays où le taux d'alphabétisation euh, reste quand même assez limité, le défi de l'apprentissage euh, du bouche à oreille, du cousin qui vous apprend comment travailler, utiliser l'Internet, comment créer un compte, comment voir ceci, c'est déjà important. Et ça, le vrai levier, les vrais enseignants, ce sont les, les jeunes. Les jeunes, euh, puisque de par leur pratique, sont nés un peu dans cette, dans cette technologie et ils s'y adaptent bien. Donc, il faut leur offrir l'écosystème et ce que nous faisons. Donc, euh, euh, nous, nous avons créé un haut conseil du numérique qui est présidé par le Premier ministre. Nous venons de créer une agence nationale pour la scientifique et l'innovation. Il y aura des incubateurs, il y aura des plateformes de challenge pour le développement. Euh, mais on s'appuie quand même aussi sur l'enseignement et l'enseignement de haut niveau. Nous avons créé les classes prépa à Nouakchott. Euh, ça fait trois ans où mes, nos étudiants ont des succès à rentrer à l'école polytechnique de Paris. Actuellement, j'ai 16 étudiants à l'école polytechnique qui ont réussi le concours de polytechnique à partir de Nouakchott, dont une fille. Donc, nous bâtissons un écosystème autour de, autour de tout ce qui est informatique, mais aussi compétences numériques et compétences dans ce domaine-là. Et on a créé aussi un centre de calcul intensif euh, avec une capacité de 380 teraflops. Ce sont des outils de calcul, ce sont des outils d'innovation, des outils de compétences mis au service de la jeunesse. En Afrique, leur permettra de pouvoir créer de la valeur ajoutée scientifique sans nécessairement aller en Europe ou aller aux États-Unis. Donc, grosso modo, c'est quand même la première vision que j'ai apportée. Mais c'est un, travers, c'est un travail de longue haleine. Il ne peut pas se faire sur une décennie, mais sur plusieurs décennies. Mais il faut s'engager tout de suite, avoir une vision claire, une stratégie et, et bâtir step by step tous les éléments de cette stratégie. C'est bon Merci, Monsieur le Ministre, pour, cette, euh, pour, cette, euh, pour ce premier jet de, d'information. Euh, je sais que c'est un peu difficile pour euh, les autres personnes qui vous ont écoutées parce qu'ils ne sont pas forcément tous francophones. Je vais, on va... On va à traduire dans un instant ce que vous avez dit et puis revenir vers vous avec une autre question que j'ai avant d'aller vers les autres intervenants. Merci, Monsieur le Ministre. I think it was uh, it was foreseen, sorry, for a slight trouble uh, for people who, do, who don't speak uh, actually French. 
Um, it was said that the translation will be made by the UN translator, but uh, as always, we are in a, in a technical environment. So um, uh, we just would like to summarize what Ms. Mr. Minister said, that actually uh, he stated three main issues in, in Africa and the developing countries that we face uh, um, when we speak about the technology and particularly during this difficult period of COVID. But as well, his, he ensured that a lot of things are going on in Mauritania uh, concerning the, the new developments, such as, for example, uh, the National Council uh, for Digital Affairs in Mauritania, the incubators and etc., where uh, the young people, and this is my question I would like to ask the minister, uh, if uh, in um, what will be the role of the young people in, uh, you know, setting the policies and the functioning of this, for example, National Council, uh, National Digital Council, as well as the incubators. And I'm bringing this question to the, to the minister and uh, we'll be translating afterwards what he said um, um, just, just in a while. Monsieur le ministre, je voudrais juste vous poser une petite question. Euh, vous avez effectivement mentionné le Conseil national du numérique, les incubateurs, donc plusieurs éléments que vous allez mettre en place à Mauritanie. Et on sait euh, que Mauritanie, en fait, a fait déjà des choses dans le domaine des nouvelles technologies en termes de... Vous avez écrit la première école sur la gouvernance de l'Internet du nord de l'Afrique. Également, vous avez été très actif sur le développement de ces législations en cybersécurité et notamment sur le renforcement des capacités euh, pour les personnes qui vont travailler dans ce domaine-là. Alors, ma question est la suivante. Par exemple, dans le domaine du développement des incubateurs, quel sera le rôle de la jeunesse, non seulement pour pour euh, profiter, je dirais, des, des options qui vont offrir ces incubateurs, mais également pour mettre en place ces incubateurs-là. Comment est-ce que dans les politiques publiques, la voix des jeunes sera prise ou est-ce que c'est déjà en cours, Monsieur le ministre C'est vrai que bâtir un tel écosystème euh, exige beaucoup quand même d'attention, une analyse réelle de, de la société, de ce qu'elle demande et des compétences à développer. La première étape, c'est vraiment les compétences. Les compétences existent. En informatique, aujourd'hui, vous avez plein d'étudiants qui ont des masters en informatique, mais qui n'ont pas de réceptacle. Et surtout dans nos pays où il n'y a pas de société de développement, ils sont un peu oisifs. Et c'est ça qu'il faut canaliser. Donc, c'est vrai que euh, avec l'Agence nationale pour la recherche scientifique et l'innovation, il y a un volet qui n'est pas la recherche scientifique universitaire, au fond, mais orienté jeunesse, orienté incubateur, développement, mais à analyser les besoins euh, en enseignement, les besoins en en application didactique, besoin à apporter des solutions aux citoyens, à repérer le, euh, les pharmacies, à faire de, de la facilitation et des services, surtout des services sociaux. C'est ça le plus important. Mais il faut savoir que ce développement et ces jeunes et ces solutions ne doivent pas être des solutions euh, seulement limitées géographiquement à la Mauritanie, mais ça peut être des solutions vendables sur le plan international. Donc, le développement des applications mobiles, le développement des solutions. Il y a actuellement plein de petites sociétés nationales où les gens font des solutions qu'ils apportent, ils répondent à des appels d'offres ailleurs. Et donc, c'est quand même cette, ces, ces compétences euh, universitaires, ces compétences d'ingénierie qu'il faut aussi élargir à d'autres jeunes qui n'ont pas la chance d'aller à l'université, mais qui ont d'autres niveaux et qui peuvent participer dans cette chaîne de valeur du numérique. Donc, la chaîne de valeur, elle est très large. Elle va bien sûr du développement des applications, mais aussi de l'acquisition des connaissances, de la diffusion de, de la culture du numérique. Nous sommes en train de réfléchir, on a dans ce, notre plan d'action de cette année 2020-2021 aussi, un plan d'alphabétisation numérique, qui consiste à quoi À créer des espaces numériques ouverts dans toutes les communes, avec les mairies, pour que des citoyens qui ne sont pas lambda peuvent venir apprendre les balbutiements de du numérique, de l'Internet, avoir un compte, avoir une adresse email, savoir interroger une base de données, demander des services à l'administration. Donc, la, la transformation digitale et les gouvernements euh, imposent aussi à nos citoyens d'avoir un niveau de culture numérique. Et, et donc, il faut les aider aussi à, à cet apprentissage. Et donc, le rôle de la jeunesse est, est énorme. Ce n'est pas, pas seulement des pensées universitaires qui vont jouer le rôle. À toutes les étapes, on a besoin. Dans le milieu rural, dans le milieu agricole, nous aurons besoin de jeunes qui vont un peu être les points focaux, être les on est en train de travailler avec l'Université officielle de Tunisie pour former des, des points focaux, enfin avoir de la certification CDSI. CDSI, c'est le certificat Internet informatique qui est très appliqué en France, euh, qui est à un niveau basique, un niveau basique d'utilisation de l'Internet. Et donc, quand les gens sont certifiés, ils peuvent faire de la formation à d'autres jeunes, à d'autres milieux plus défavorisés, etc. Donc, ça, c'est tout un écosystème à bâtir. J'espère que j'ai contribué à 
Monsieur le ministre, oui, je pense que c'est très clair et c'est assez complet. On retient beaucoup de choses dites. On retient l'espace numérique, les espaces numériques ouverts, qui est une bonne chose. Donc, pourront profiter euh, les jeunes, également les jeunes qui veulent participer euh, à l'élaboration des politiques publiques, y compris euh, euh, au développement des, des, des solutions techniques, je dirais, aussi cette ch chaîne de valeur du numérique que vous êtes en train de, de citer. Euh, je vais passer en anglais pour faciliter quand même la compréhension pour les autres et euh, on reviendra vers vous en français. Merci encore, euh, Monsieur le Ministre. And I'm sorry, I will, I will speak into English and I think there are two or three main things that just uh, was raised by the Minister. It's uh, what's going on in Mauritania. They are preparing the kind of free open spaces uh, with the uh, Wi-Fi connection, as I, if I understood correctly, that will be accessible to everyone, to everybody. And uh, uh, he's uh, kind of saying that uh, uh, young people can be, uh, you know, um, Uh, can also take this and um, uh, can be profitable in terms of they can participate in the policy development by using these spaces where we don't have internet today, but also it can facilitate them to be connected. So also to bring technical solutions as well. Uh, and uh, he also said something um, very interesting about the chain of values, of digital values, but also he pointed out a few elements about the importance of skills. And then it brings me actually to Kasper Kasper Klingi. And Kasper Klingi, I know that Microsoft Corporation, uh, you took the problem seriously really this year and you developed this um, program on the digital skills. But before we go in on this and we would be, we would love to, to know more, how does it work? How the young people can enter actually this program? How can they benefit? Because it's what we are hearing from the minister is actually um, young people in the developing countries, they do need this, but I believe in the developed world as well. Um, but before we turn to um, to this, I would like to call um, Adia from Indonesia. I think she has a question I, and, uh, and we will try to answer it afterwards. Adia. Please, you have the floor. Okay. Good morning, the distinguished panelists and friends from Youth IDF. Thank you, Yulia, for the opportunity. I'm Idea. Greetings from Indonesia. I'm very humbled to raise a question to the panelists. Uh, this pandemic has revealed the reality of digital disparity among students across the globe. While the migration uh, to digital platforms should have democratized the learning process, could the honorable panelists today share some initiative uh, from them to improve this situation that might inspire young people who are watching right now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adia, for your question. I think this question goes quite well with what uh, uh, Mr. Sidiul Salem just underlined about the uh, still the importance of skills and of digital skills that can bring opportunities. And to the question I just raised um, to Kasper Klingi about this program on digital skills of the Microsoft that we would like to learn more and to learn more particularly how young people can technically enter to this program and be part. Kasper Klingi. Well, thanks very much, uh, Julia, and uh, also thanks for your kind word, words in the beginning on, on us uh, you know, supporting your work. I think when you're getting as old as I am, it's a pleasure every time you have the opportunity to engage with, uh, with the youth and, and younger people. And uh, to, to our friend who just asked the last question, I just spent more than three years in Indonesia and in Jakarta, so it's really great to reconnect with uh, a country that I, I, uh, I miss quite a lot, uh, to be honest with you, especially sitting in Europe now in the middle of winter where it's dark and, and cold outside. Um, I think both to the minister, but also to your question and to, to the question from, from the youth panel, you know, we are in many ways in this unprecedented situation that everybody's talking about. Uh, and the conclusion that I think a lot of us has reached, whether we work uh, in civil society, whether we are a minister uh, in Africa, or whether we work for a, a big technology company like Microsoft, is that we really need all hands on deck to get us through this global pandemic But I would actually also say that the global pandemic is not the main focus area. The main focus area is the transformation that we are seeing around the world, which is driven by uh, technology and digitalization. Um, what COVID-19 has done is of course to accelerate a process that was already there. Um, and I think in some areas uh, we have benefited from the increased focus on the need for all of us to come online because today it's not just a nice thing to, to be, it's a, it's a need for a necessity for all of us to uphold jobs, to make sure that our economies will not uh, suffer more than, than they already are. And, and, and on this one, uh, we really need to make sure that whether we work for government or a private company, we, we need to add all the resources available 
um, to, to do our part to get us through uh, all of this. And Julia, as you highlighted, uh, our small contribution to this is actually a big initiative that we launched a couple of months ago, a global skilling initiative where the aim is initially to train uh, more than 25 million people around the world uh, in 10 different learning paths using uh, LinkedIn, using GitHub, using Microsoft uh, Learn, where we are trying to identify based on data, uh, you know, the areas where we will see a gap between uh, skills in demand and, uh, and what competences are currently available. So, and this is free of charge. Uh, you know, I'd be very happy to, to share a link in the chat here where everybody, regardless of whether you're sitting in Jakarta, whether you're sitting in, 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 you know, in, in Africa, South America, uh, in Europe, you can, you can get access to these learning paths. Um, and for a very small contribution, you will also be able to get a certificate when you have uh, completed uh, these different uh, learning opportunities. And, and these are things and these are skills that we, we know also working from our cost, for our customers and our partners that will come in demand. So it's things like software developers, like graphic designers, uh, IT help desks. So, you know, it might not be, be um, um, it, it might be quite obvious skill sets, but, but we are seeing that the gap is really increasing between what we have and what will be in demand, also again accelerated by, by COVID-19. Um, what we want to do is, uh, is make, this, make this not only available, but in fact also increasingly focus on, on cybersecurity, which I know is a big uh, topic for, for today's debate. Uh, that is unfortunately the flip side of the coin. Uh, as we digitalize our societies, we also increase vulnerabilities. Uh, we've seen a number of uh, attacks happening over the last couple of months. We published in Microsoft uh, several examples of uh, the devastating impact of these cyber uh, security attacks. And it doesn't really matter whether you are, you know, uh, a minister in, uh, in Mauritania, whether you are sitting in Europe, whether you're sitting in Southeast Asia, we are all subject to these attacks. And we have to really upskill our capabilities to mitigate the risk that we've seen from cybersecurity attacks. So that's one area where we're working uh, both together with, with you, but also with other youth organizations saying, can we, can we organize sort of an interface, if you like, a, a feedback mechanism where we're listening to younger people? What do you guys need? Can we find ways of working together with you and, and providing these uh, skilling opportunities so that we can help drive a more uh, safe and secure uh, society? that will uphold what is, I think, the fundamental need in, in the 21st century. That is that technology is really driven by trust, that we have trust uh, between people, between societies and, and the technologies that we're using. So we're super delighted. We've trained, uh, if we just look at Europe, more than 2.2 million people as of today. Uh, but this is not the end of the process. We'll continue to push ahead. And uh, please feel free to take a look on, on the opportunities. Uh, we're quite proud of what we've been able to do so far. Uh, thank you, Kaspar Klinge. It was uh, it was very clear, and uh, the you, the link that you just uh, mentioned will be very helpful. I can imagine for for everybody to have the link and to understand how the skills program that you mentioned, developed by the Microsoft Corporation, together with the LinkedIn, actually allow the young people who are jobless or who are looking for the job or who are just you know would like to um, become the inventor of have the ideas to get new skills, digital skills that the minister just mentioned. Uh, vous avez juste justement mentionné tout à l'heure, Monsieur le Ministre, le, euh, le besoin de nouvelles connaissances en fait dans le domaine du numérique, et c'est ce que Casper Kling a. Euh, à souligner avec le programme qu'ils ont mis en place, le Microsoft, hein, sur le, le renforcement des capacités et de nouvelles, euh, de nouvelles capacités numériques dans le domaine du numérique. Uh, so, um, so, exactly, this link will be very useful to understand how the young people can enter this program, how in a very concrete terms they can benefit, but uh, afterwards, um, you know, bring to the market uh, um, new professions, new innovations and new technical solutions as well. Uh, but you mentioned something, uh, and I can imagine that you just mentioned cybersecurity, and we can imagine that in this new skills initiative, obviously the cybersecurity skills are part of it, and the new skills probably on cyber diplomacy and how we can raise the trust of the society in digital. So thank you for obviously for mentioning this, and you know we we'll work a lot on on the cybersecurity skills as well. Uh, so the link will be very well welcome, and we will um, put this in the um, in the comments of the YouTube channel and the Facebook. I would just 
to uh, like to remind our audience that we are discussing the role of the young people and the youth activism in digital. We had a multilingual, somehow it happened now, discussion in French and English uh, with me uh, trying to translate. But I hope it also demonstrates us that internet is multilingual and we can all, you know, if we have the common values to share and the, the for example, the value of trust, we can all communicate. So I would like to call to you um, to put your comments and questions um, in the chat room as well. And um, I would like to turn to um, down from the Philippines and I think Dawn uh, is an activist in the Philippines. And I think you have also a question. Dawn, the floor is yours, please. Please. Uh, yes. Thank you, Yulia. And thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity to join the amazing group of speakers uh, for this uh, event. Um, my question, I, I think most of my questions were already answered. So I think I'll just focus on um, emphasizing the, the young people uh, who are largely dependent on digital services. So I would like to ask how um, hard the government, the CSOs and the private sectors address um, cybersecurity and online risk in the midst of the pandemic and also in the age of um, um, disinformation. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Um, I don't know who would like to pick this question. Uh, Bokarba, how do you feel? Would you like to answer this question and also maybe bring the focus of the uh, telecom industry? What the telecom industry, well, to, to get to go with the question of Don, but also I do have a, a, the question for Bokarba um, uh, from, uh, from the Samana Telecommunication Council. And I, I do know, for example, that um, Omani Telecom, that is part of the of the Samana Council, they work a lot on education. Uh, for example, during the COVID, so telecom companies can do a lot. For example, by giving the platform or allowing, you know, uh, the SMS services is what I saw. But I know also that your vice uh, vice chair is uh, very well, uh, you know, is putting on his Twitter that one of his priorities is empowering youth and uh, in the capacities of young people. So, Bukabar, can you give us your perspective and also try maybe to bring in the answer to the dawn question. Thank you very much, uh, Yulia, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. First of all, I would like to thank you very much for giving me the pleasure to be with you today and to have this, uh, this conversation today. And I would like to emphasize that this is, not, uh, this is the conversation that should have happened earlier and we cannot miss it. Now, let me spend about two, three minutes and look at the global context and the ground realities in which we are today, uh, especially from the perspective of the Arab region, uh, let's call it the South Asia, Middle East and North Africa. Number one, youth population is driving demand for internet application by fueling the mobile data consumption market. That's number one. E-commerce and online games application have also grown significantly in the past years due to the popularity among the young population. The youth is at the heart and is a key driver of overall innovation with a focus on mobility, internationalization, and competitiveness. And Believe me or not, in the region, almost 108 million young people in the Middle East alone. And this is the largest number of young population to transition to adulthood in the history. Now, why am I saying that? This shows that the youth are a tremendous <laughs> resource and an even bigger opportunity and challenge. Thus. We need to harness this resource for the next generation through capacity building and human capital development endeavor or human capital investment. Now, what are we doing? And I can speak on behalf of not only the telecom operators, but also the private sector at large. You mentioned at the beginning ITU. I am chairing the private sector at the ITU. So what the industry is doing to support the use innovator, innovation to fight, for example, COVID or during the COVID time. And uh, I would like to come up with some example. 
the, the telecom and ICT ecosystem in the region is among the greatest catalysts of growth in the many low and middle income countries of the region. Young people are not only a part of the ecosystem as a consumer, but also as contributors and innovators. And the private sector recognized that very well. That's one of the reasons we are seeing young people around the world developing new technologies to help in the fight against COVID-19. And these innovation can include, for example, low cost ventilators were developed by young people, 3D printing medical supplies, using in some countries shipping container ICU wards, or leveraging technologies to innovate contact tracing as we have seen, for example, in South Korea or remote learning and redistribution of goods, just to name a few of the examples. Now, to bring this innovation and coming to the question asked by our colleagues, to bring this innovation to practical life and to where there are needed most, a number of collaborative efforts have been undertaken by telecom operators, private sector, their strategic partner and the young innovators. And this collaboration within the industry have created an enabling environment, and this has mobilized youth-led startups to turn idea into actionable solutions. I give you just two examples, not to be long. In the Arab region, programs such as Zain, which is a telecom operator based in Kuwait and many other countries, Zain Innovation Center, we call it Zinc are becoming instrumental in unlocking opportunities in Jordan, in Kuwait's entrepreneurial startup ecosystem. The ultimate aim of Zing, this program, is helping young innovators turn their idea into productive project that would be marketed locally, regionally, and internationally. Second example, and you refer to that in your talk, Bahrain, Batelco, Brinks Batelco IoT Hub is supporting Bahrain youth by promoting innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship, and most importantly, the upskilling of future generation of technology experts. So just to give you an idea of what's going on, but of course, the secretary, the under secretary general Fabrizio was mentioning about leaving no one behind. And this is a global trend worldwide across the entire private sector and government. We should not leave anyone behind. That means youth, that means disability, that means vulnerable people. We want them to be a part of the entire value chain and that is driven by innovation. Innovation comes from the youth. I hope it answered the question, Yulia. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Bukar. Um, thank you a lot for your answer, and I think it's uh, it's uh, showing as well. Your answer actually uh, is is very detailed and is showing us that a lot of things going on in the Middle East, and the young people who would like to achieve something, who would like to be useful in their societies, uh, they can, you know, they have uh, institutions where to turn. So now they, you know, that Semenek Telecommunication Council probably will take into account. Uh, this, uh, this youth perspective as well, and uh, your members are taken already, as you just mentioned. So I think very interesting, very interesting will be to have the links where, you know, of the initiative you mentioned for them. We will put afterwards in the um, in comments, uh, the YouTube channel and the and the Facebook as well. Uh, we also have, because now we have the Middle East perspective, let's say, but we have the question in the chat room about if the Microsoft Corporation um, a project on skills is a world, uh, worldwide project or just uh, focused on one region. I think Kasper Kling is a question that Joao from Portugal is bringing to you. Um, just very quickly, if we, if you could, uh, could could give us this answer because yeah probably the, it's very interesting for them julia could you just repeat that i'm so sorry but i have a couple uh, of no, just issues saying, here um, yeah. i was just saying that um uh bokar bar brought us the perspective of the middle east from the telecom um industry but um, uh, young people are asking and joao from portugal if the the program of the microsoft corporation on digital skills it's a worldwide or it's a uh, region focused and if it's region focused, do we have diff, you know, uh, different approaches, let's say? 
Okay, well, thanks a lot for repeating the question. Sorry that I didn't catch it the first time. This is a global initiative, and I've just tried, I hope it reached everybody, to share the, the link where, where you can go in and see these different uh, 10 learning paths that are available, and you can also see the different uh, skill sets that, we, that we're trying to, to support. Um, a couple of points here. Um, we, we are hoping that uh, this will be a contribution uh, to the more traditional educational services that are being, of course, uh, in, um, in 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 the sphere of of, of governments and and the public sector around the world, um, it's a it's a small contribution. It's a beginning, but we do think that with the insights and the expertise that we have with with LinkedIn, with GitHub, with Microsoft Learn, that it's something that is worthwhile, especially as we are on the brink of a quite dramatic transformation uh, that uh, that really goes to I think both what Mr. Pokan also with the minister alluded to earlier that. One of the most important things also on a personal point, from a personal point of view that I think we're facing is to really try and avoid a digital divide. Um, I think we have a digital divide uh, locally. We have it even inside countries in, in Europe where those that have access to high-speed broadband, uh, primarily living in the more rural, uh, more urban areas, that it's easier for them. It's not easy, but it's slightly easier for them to cope uh, with a global pandemic like COVID-19. Um, but even in, in, in the European countries, uh, we have people that are without the same access, that are struggling, uh, keeping their jobs, uh, you know, contributing to, to the economies, uh, etc. But if we zoom out and look at this at a global level, I think it is so evident that, um, you know, the accelerated digitalization that we're looking at really requires us to focus a lot on making sure that everybody is on board in the bus shouldn't matter where you live. We have to make sure that, you know, the more than 3 billion people that currently do not have access to the internet, that they will get that access because, you know, in the world of tomorrow, the digital economy will really require, regardless, I think, of sectors or, or the areas that you're working in, will require us uh, to have access to the internet and have basic uh, and fundamental skills. So I think that's one of the big, big global uh, challenges, and I'm very happy we had the Fabrizio speak to this in the beginning. And I think I actually just wanted to commend the work of the Secretary General and, and high-level um, uh, panel on, on digital cooperation for highlighting that this is not only um, uh, an issue for one part of the world. This is really something we we need to make sure that we uh, that we bridge the gap that we're currently seeing uh, on digital skills and access to basic digital infrastructure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kasper Klinger, for bringing these questions and uh, this answer. And I think uh, the answer is actually yes, that we have the intention to have this as a global initiative and uh, actually to work on this digital divide uh, with the initiative on digital skills. These people left behind, as uh, said the uh, UN Under Secretary General Fabrizio Hochschild, that he mentioned as one of the biggest issues of our century. Indeed, um, and during the COVID crisis, I would like to turn to Professor Rolf Weber. Would like to know how it's going on uh, and what's going on in Switzerland. Switzerland is in Europe. Obviously, we had already more or less a European perspective, but Switzerland is not part of the European Union. So we would like to have the point of view of Rolf Weber. And I think we have the question from Monica before we go and turn to. Uh, to Professor uh, Weber um, as well. Monica, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Monica, as you may know by now. Um, you've touched, like Casper and Bukhar touched on this topic about uh, programs, but however, my question is, do you plan or do you know if currently any regional or international institutions uh, would put forward the support of um, young NGOs proposing solutions specifically uh, targeted to the terrible pandemic situation. For instance, national, European or United Nations or other investment fund that is going to be focused on proposals from youngsters NGOs for digital solutions related to the cost, poverty, unemployment or lower quality of education and medical services plus uh, concrete or specialized funding uh, aimed to youngster startups uh, for the digital services in the 2020 um, situation. Thank you. Thank you in advance. Thank you, Monica. And we will bring this question maybe first to Professor uh, Rolf Weber in terms of uh, how's going on in uh, Switzerland uh, if we want uh, to, um, well, for the for the innovators, for the startups. When we 
think about actually Switzerland and the digital, we obviously will think about Zug, about uh, you know cryptocurrency, about blockchain, about the facilities that it's it's what the young people, all young people have in mind actually, right? And so you are a professor of law, but also you're practicing in the well-known um, uh, law practitioner. So we'd like to know how easy it is actually in, in Switzerland, for example, for the young innovators to set a company, to get uh, and to have access to these funds, to these uh, startup, um, you know, support. What's going on in Switzerland, for, in Switzerland from this point of view? And then we will be back to other panelists with the same question. Thank you. Uh, okay. Rolf Weber, you had the floor. Um, thank you very much, uh, Julia, for the invitation to this highly interesting panel. My position somehow at the end is not uh, so easy because the legal perspective is usually not the most attractive uh, angle in a, a discussion. But let me uh, say upfront before I turn to blockchain artificial uh, intelligence, intelligence, what we uh, see at the university level is indeed a dramatic change in the education, and uh, I think it's a change in favor of the younger generation. Instead of boring uh, lectures in a classroom, we um, offer our insights now online, facilitating access uh, not only by Swiss students, but also by foreign students. And uh, this whole uh, change uh, in the uh, education uh, has caused quite a lot of headache for the um, older generation. And the fact that it worked out quite nicely, I would uh, say over the last six to eight months shows how important universities are considering the attendance of young people. Now I move uh, to your principal uh, question about uh, legal environment uh, as well as the ability of young people to start startups in Switzerland. About a year ago, or maybe slightly more, a member of the Federal Council, that's our government, has publicly said, Switzerland wants to become the blockchain nation. And uh, this is, uh, of course, a marketing uh, argument, I have to admit, but I do think that uh, this statement goes along with quite a lot of efforts uh, in Switzerland to facilitate the um, creation of small startups and the successful implementation of new uh, business uh, models. And uh, this fact does have a certain uh, tradition. If you look back a couple of years ago, for example, uh, Bitcoin has chosen to have its uh, head a domicile in Switzerland, in Zug. Shortly later, um, Vitalik Buterin came from Russia and established Ethereum and the Ether uh, currency. And if you look at the age of Vitalik at that time, some seven years ago, he was really a young uh, leader. And these two practical examples show, in my opinion, that Switzerland tries uh, to be uh, open for uh, new inventors. The regulatory environment, and I'm not going into the details uh, in you of the running time, the regulatory environment in Switzerland is quite liberal, is quite flexible. We got a new law which uh, covers uh, in about uh, 2025 legal provisions, most parts of uh, the blockchain area, artificial intelligence so far is not yet regulated. So we uh, do have a lot uh, of room of maneuver to apply artificial intelligence, uh, big data analytics, as long as we comply with the general laws. If I compare the new Swiss law with the proposals of the EU Commission, in particular in the financial markets, I have uh, to say the European Commission wants uh, to regulate with about 10 times more uh, provisions than Switzerland. This is also a uh, good sign. So um, all uh, overall, 
I do indeed uh, think that uh, the younger uh, generation would uh, see somehow uh, open arms in Switzerland to establish uh, new business uh, models to incorporate companies. Obviously, as I said, I do not want to uh, start now a marketing campaign for Switzerland. Switzerland does have also certain disadvantages, for example, the high living costs, which also must be taken into account if a new startup um, is uh, created. But we do uh, also uh, have uh, quite a large number of organizations supporting new um, enterprises in the context uh, of COVID-19 uh, crisis, special funds from the government, which otherwise is maybe a little bit less uh, uh, open uh, to blockchain and artificial intelligence, or is, is maybe uh, taking more time to implement blockchain and artificial intelligence. So the Swiss uh, government has offered special funds to already existing, but now starving startups and to uh, new startups, such uh, funds either do not have to be repaid at all or uh, only after six to eight uh, years uh, without obligation to pay uh, interest. So a couple of opportunities are um, existing in uh, um, Switzerland. We also do have, coming back to the question of uh, Monica NGOs, uh, which uh, support initiatives of the younger popula population. And basically, since I do not have time to go more into the details, I would like to invite the younger generation to write me directly an email if you have any specific uh, question to the uh, financial and legal environment in Switzerland. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you a lot, uh, Professor uh, Weber. I think you brought uh, two very interesting points and very detailed ones on the online education and as well on the situation in Switzerland. We are four minutes left before the end. Uh, so I see um, a very logical channel actually going from this online education then open that just mentioned by Professor Weber uh, that opened the door to the new skills um, that will offer the uh, Microsoft uh, Corporation project on digital skills. And then we will have uh, born the new projects and new innovations maybe. And we can turn to, uh, to, the, uh, to the Middle East, to the funds and initiatives that Bokarba just mentioned to get, you know, um, to, um, uh, to bring the value to the benefits and actually to raise uh, the, uh, the value of these innovations as well as in Switzerland that just uh, mentioned by uh, Professor Weber as well. And then we go to the policy level mentioned by, uh, by Minister Sidiul Salem with the National Digital Council and the incubators that are created. And so uh, this participation of young uh, people, of course, all, not, uh, all is not rose and um, the voice of young people and of the youth activism is maybe not on, at the level that the young people would like to have, but still there are things and uh, also the most important is to have the access to this information that the executive leaders just brought to us. Uh, just to uh, maybe end our conversation today, we have one question and the open will be, the floor will be open for your uh, comments, but very short in one minute. Uh, we have one question from Linar Schulze uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the youth community by asking that and saying that the IGF itself is not the decision making place. So uh, generally speaking, how uh, you executives, you take the discussions and the thoughts given and um, throughout by the youth communities to your companies with the suggestions. I do have already the answer, the first answer to this question with the example of Eureed.eu, who created actually after a number of workshops and talks we had at the IGF together with them, the youth council at the .eu, Youth Advisory Council, where the young people can advise and influence the policies and the strategies of the .eu. So uh, things are happening, but I would like to turn to our uh, distinguished speakers if they would like very shortly in one uh, minute, please uh, say what, how they will they answer this question. Um, I don't know who would like to have the floor. Uh, the floor is yours, please. 
Rolf Weber, but very short, please. Yeah, of course, uh, very short. You are already mentioned uh, Eurodic, and I would like to add, finally, it depends upon uh, the uh, older generation to really include uh, the younger generation into the discussions. About 12 years ago, I have co-founded um, the Swiss uh, IGF, and at that time, you were about uh, two or three representatives of the older generation. Now, uh, the Swiss IGF is basically run by five, six representatives of the younger generation. So we have been very consequent in including the younger generation uh, in the process of preparing the Swiss IGF. And somehow I was glad that I could hand over my task to the younger generation in the meantime. Yulia, you are muted. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Bokar, as well. Uh, thank you, Professor Weber. I was saying that we know that you are very, was very active and stay very active in the internet governance sphere. So we are taking your statement as a call to young people to create and to be engaged in internet governance talks at regional, regional or national levels and maybe to create uh, or co-create the national um, IGFs or the youth IGFs. I don't know if Bukhar Ba or Kasper Klinge would like to add something and we'll go to the minister afterwards. Bukhar, please. But yeah, very yeah, very quickly. I, I would like to frame most of the question into a few answers. Uh, from a private sector perspective, the way that we look at this uh, uh, digital space, we subdivide into the demand side and the supply side. We are taking care of the supply side, which means building the infrastructure, laying down the fiber, putting 5G on place, uh, integrating the IoT. That's fine. Now, we need to stimulate the demand. The government is playing a role, which is putting in place the right policies and regulation to incentivize an increase of the demand. Now, coming to investment and coming to innovation. Innovation will be driving the future. The money is available for funding those projects, provided that it has sustainability. Now, concerning the youth, they need to have an alignment between as a stakeholder between what they want to do, the private sector and the government. There are some institutions, IGF is one of, one of them. Answering Lenhard question is, ITU also is, uh, is integrating academia, SMEs, innovators. So ITU could be a point of contact. At the Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development also, we are promoting a number of initiatives. I am a part of the commission and we have spoken about digital skill. We are creating a working group. So I believe there is a gap that has to be filled by aligning priorities, requests, and what is available. And those entities exist. The funding is available, but they need much more guidance to understand in which direction to move. And within the given time, I cannot elaborate more, but we can do it offline. But solutions exist. It's a matter of alignment and organizing agenda together. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Bokar. Um, and um, uh, we are also taking this as a call. As uh, well, you know, if you want to uh, have something done in uh, in have the influence and participate in policy development, please stay engaged at the IGF, at the ITU, and other institutions. It's practically what I hear as well, in a very, of course, short and summarized manner. I don't know, Kasper Klinge, would you would you like to add something to this? I'll be very brief. I know we're running uh, out of time here. Um, listen, when we, when we look at how the world is going to evolve over the next five years, we can see that 149 million jobs will probably be established in the area of technology and digitalization. And, and as Bokar was just mentioning, our view and also my personal view is we have to use data in merging demands, future demands with the supply side. And that's part of the skilling initiative that we launched in, in Microsoft, making available if you go to the link that I've shared. You can zoom in on individual countries and you can see in different sectors what we expect based on our own data will be in demand over the next couple of years and how many people with those skill sets that will be available. So I think that's a modern way of, of doing it. But if you ask me what my wish list will be, I think it's basically sort of three things. We have to invest more in, in access, uh, broadband access, 
um, making sure that everybody will, will become online. The second thing is what we're discussing today, making sure that we have the skill sets uh, that are required of tomorrow. That's a dual responsibility, in my view, between the public sector and the private sector. We're trying to do a small part on, on our side. And then the last thing is that when you look at all those activities, we have to make sure, unfortunately, that we continue to focus on cybersecurity. We know that uh, COVID-19 has hit all of us very hard. Unfortunately, it has not hit uh, those malign actors, both state actors and non-state actors that are using you know, every single hour, every single minute to try and attack our critical infrastructure, even our hospitals, the WTO we've seen, uh, so WHO we've seen, uh, you know, pre pretty vicious uh, attacks over the last couple of, of months. We have to make sure that we build up our resilience. Um, and again, I think that's a, a situation that requires all hands on deck. Uh, thank you, Casper. So uh, better or you know, stronger upskilling programs and the promotion of these upskilling programs. And I think it's very well summarized by James Park, um, Pick, sorry, um, in the chat room by saying, I invest more in education, especially within demand skills for the jobs of the future, the jobs that we don't even know uh, that they don't exist today, but they will exist tomorrow, right? Um, I would like to turn to Mr. Minister, we're really two minutes left to have his point of view and by, you know, I would say, and as we started in French, so euh, monsieur le ministre, je voudrais me tourner vers vous euh, pour, pour euh, monsieur le ministre, qu'est-ce que vous nous entendez Monsieur le ministre uh, I, Well, we probably have the technical issues, so we will uh, then end uh, with, this, uh, great, uh, with this great, I would say, uh, summary by saying, yes, invest more in education, especially uh, in, in the demand skills, and uh, maybe this will allow us, as well as by bringing the young uh, people in the... Um, in the policy making and in the development of policies and the development of standards by promoting this uh, cyber diplomacy among the young people, we will uh, try to achieve to reduce this uh, gap between those left behind, as said by the UN Under Secretary General, and those very well connected. So I would like to uh, thank all our distinguished guests for being uh, present uh, today, for being with us, and um, um, and we apologize for technical issues it's uh, um, yes we are learning uh, and uh, hoping to become a professional studio we're not uh, there yet but uh, thank you for being with us thank you for our audience for great summaries and questions and thank you for those who followed us online uh, we will uh, make sure to bring all this information in the comments uh, on youtube channel as well as the facebook monsieur le ministre un très grand merci pour votre participation et je pense que votre message même en français parce que j'ai reçu les les petits messages en WhatsApp en me disant, bon, nous, on ne comprend pas le, le français, mais pourtant, on a compris le message de monsieur le ministre. Ce qui démontre, en effet, euh, sa force et, euh, je dirais, euh, euh, sa direction donnée à la jeunesse, y compris aux, à ceux qui prennent les décisions. Monsieur le ministre, encore une fois, un grand merci d'être avec nous et d'avoir accepté cette invitation. Et on espère à très bientôt, à très bientôt euh, ici en Europe ou à Nouakchott également. Merci. Et à bientôt. Thank you for being with us and bye bye. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Au revoir.